television anchorman Rajdeep Sabdesai happened to be lunching with the top government official in charge of power as the news came in. For the next hour, we didn't stop the lunch. We went ahead with the lunch. The power minister was lunching with the journalist rather than being perhaps there in his office directing operations. That in itself epitomized for me that it wasn't being treated as some kind of a national emergency, but another day in the office. Despite billions of dollars in new infrastructure, power interruptions are chronic in India. Consumers, large and small, rely on backup systems at huge cost to both the environment and economy, says energy expert Kirit Parikh. He traces the problem to policies that never really took into account the cost of power and gave it away to some consumers. We started out with saying that farmers should get cheap and free electricity. This was 30 years ago when you wanted farmers to really adopt more modern technologies. It was considered a good way to promote the Green Revolution. Power was distributed cheaply or free to farmers and other groups whose votes politicians courted. Little effort was made to meter it. That prompted many people to hook themselves up illegally. Parik says a third of all power is stolen off the grid. 30% of, of, the, of the generated electricity is not charged to anyone. With little new money coming in, public utilities haven't been able to expand capacity or buy enough fuel, like coal or natural gas, both in short supply anyway. Power must be rationed, but some regions overdraw their allotment. That can cause the system to shut down or, as it did last year, collapse. But power failures are just the tip of the iceberg the urban half of a much larger problem. The grid failure may have knocked out power to a vast area. 600 million people live in it. But to anywhere from a third to a half of them, it really didn't matter because they've never been hooked up to the electric grid. Vast swaths of rural India remain off the grid or get minimal, unpredictable service from it. In the evening, uh, nothing is visible. So it's all dark. Uh, life ceases to exist after sunset. Ratnesh Yadav has tried to tackle at least this part of the problem. He and a partner founded a company called Husk Power. Their idea? Village-based microgrids. At this one in the village of Pateli in northeastern Bihar state, tractors arrived with rice husk, the byproduct of milling this region's staple crop. It's poured into a hopper about a hundred pounds per hour and gasified to run a simple turbine. Each evening, 700 customers have access to power for five hours. Bhagwan Singh is one. He runs a tiny snack shop that he says he can keep open later. We used to work with a gas light. This is much cheaper. We used to stay open until 9 in the evening. Now we stay open till 10 or 10.30, so it's a benefit. The newly electrified homes stand out in the dark, with children clustered around the single light bulb doing homework. Just one low-power turbine is enough to make the enterprise viable, Yadav says. 32 kilowatt is a small amount of energy, but for uh, places like these, it's uh, uh, huge. It can power, uh, on an average, it powers 450 households. Because their primary need uh, right now is uh, light and cell phone recharging. In five years, Husk Power has installed 75 of these simple plants. Their networks cover an area no bigger than a couple of square miles, with wires strung on poles made from bamboo, a renewable resource like the rice husk fuel. The good thing about uh, this rice husk is it has no alternate usage. It doesn't burn easily, so you can't use it for cooking. Uh, you cannot feed it to cattle because it has high silica in it. Uh, so it is a waste. It has no value for uh, anybody else. And that's why, and it is in plenty. Yadav was speaking on this day to a group of foreign so-called impact investors who put their dollars into socially conscious enterprises. The business model, he said, relies on simple, cheap, and green technology and local control. Each plant is franchised to local entrepreneurs. In this village, it's Shambhu Singh. The ownership and operations is uh, his responsibility. And we take care of uh, maintenance and after sales. And also. how is the electricity distributed? We use uh, double jacketed wires. And uh, we lay down our own distribution network and connect customers' houses uh, 
from that. Jacketed or insulated wires prevent both accidental electrocution and power theft. Local franchisee Singh, whose family was in the textile business, said he's had no problem signing people up. In the first month, I got 25. In just five months, Singh told the group that number has grown to 700. He collects payments in advance each month, not hard, he says, because the service is reliable and costs the equivalent of just 50 cents less than the far dimmer and dirtier kerosene lanterns or candles. How long does it take to recover the investment that you did in this plant? Two, two and a half years. Everybody is making profit. Everybody is uh, benefiting. It's not a charity or donation. The visitors seem to agree and want in. Eric Berkowitz is with a Singapore-based fund that has invested $2.5 million. He likes Husk Power's growth prospects. As people uh, increase in income, which hopefully they will, and they'll create new livelihood opportunities, they'll have opportunities to incrementally increase the electricity that they'll take from, from these kind of solutions and maybe add uh, two lights, three lights, a radio, a TV, uh, a refrigerator. It's not the only solution. There's other solutions that involve solar technologies, and Husk Power is actually looking at those kind of solutions as well. Renewable fuel plants also qualify for subsidies from India's government and possibly credits in a global carbon trade. Power expert Parikh appreciates what micro plants can provide, but he doesn't see them as a long-term solution. Most people aspire to have electricity when they flip the system button and get a power as and when they want it. So this is the kind of uh, enterprises that do work, but there are all small-scale examples. When you really add up, how many megawatts can you really provide this way? I I'm sure that it's a wonderful idea they're getting electricity till the time the, the, the grid comes and reaches them. He acknowledges that time may be a ways off before 24-7 grid power reaches all of India or even urban areas that suffered most from the massive blackout. As the debate rages on in Delhi over the right mix of coal, nuclear and green energy, Husk Power's goal is to install almost 2,000 new microgrids in the rural areas by 2015. Fred's reporting is a partnership with the Undertold Stories Project at St. Mary's University in Minnesota. Finally tonight, remembering the original Dear Abby. That's the name tens of millions of newspaper readers around the globe recognized for more than four decades. The woman behind the pen name Abigail Van Buren was Pauline Phillips, born 94 years ago in Sioux City, Iowa. She provided snappy, frank advice in a column that appeared eventually in more than a thousand papers in its heyday before the age of the web. Amy Dickinson, who writes the advice column Ask Amy, is one of many columnists who followed in the years since, and she joins us now. Welcome to the program. What was it about Abigail Van Buren? Was it her her tone, her life experience, her sympathy? What made her so credible to so many readers? Well, you know, I think it, it's amazing when I think about it because she started uh, something over 60 years ago that's really basically still going very strong. Um, what it is was, you know, she wasn't a doctor. She was not a psychologist. She wasn't really trained, so to speak. But what she was was very practical, Midwestern, common sense, and she was uh, really the ultimate listener. You know, she, people trusted her, and you could tell, you know, from reading her column that she was very genuine, she was very wise, she was super snappy, which I love, of course. Um, and, you know, she just created a tremendous legacy. She occasionally doled out tough love, occasionally even contacted people who wrote her that she thought might be in real trouble. Um, did she earn a kind of authority? You mentioned she wasn't a doctor, but she must have had some kind of authority after all that time. Well, part of it is, you know, it's in the writing. It's, it's, the, it's the authority that, you're, that your auntie has or that that smart mom next door has. You know, the idea that she would uh, respect you while she was listening to you and sometimes respect you enough to dole out a little smack if you needed it. You know, it's funny, just yesterday I was composing my own column and I actually wrote the line. I, I wasn't aware of her passing, of course, and 
but I wrote the line, that's the tough part of tough love. And in a way, that line is, is it started with Dear Abby. Well, you could see the country and its mores changing over time through her column with the kind of things, the kind of problems that readers brought to her. Does that continue to this day? Can you see America changing in the kind of problems that Americans have? Oh, absolutely. And when, when you go back, as I have done and read her columns from the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, they're very much a capsule of their time. The fact is, though, the questions change, but the advice really remains constant in that it's smart. Letters I get, I mean, I probably get 50 queries a day about Facebook, about social media and its impact on relationships. But the advice I give, the, it's grounded in the sorts of things that Dear Abby was talking about in the 50s and 60s. You know, Amy, when you replaced Ann Landers in the Chicago Tribune, in fact, Dear Abby's sister, her twin sister yet, uh, there was no question that the paper was going to find another advice columnist and keep the franchise going. The only question was who was going to do it, and you were chosen. Why is it in this day and age, in 2013, when there's so many sources for so many kinds of information, that it's felt that that's an essential component of a newspaper? I just think that um, this is a genre that's really tried and true. And, and Ray, you know, where would we be if you, if you opened your new newspaper to the back and, and the jumble and the comic strips and the, and the crossword puzzle, and where would you be if you didn't see an advice column there? You know, it's very much a part of what we've come to expect in newspapers, and frankly, um, it's about the only place in a newspaper where readers really communicate directly with the writer. You mentioned that you sort of went to school on Abigail Van Le uh, Buren's <laughs> columns over the years. Are there any that stand out today or her ways of handling things that stick with you and you may have even modeled yourself after? Well, mainly it's, the, it's sort of this genuine honesty that I felt she conveyed really well. There was also a lot of compassion. And I think it's, it's very easy to sort of stand up there and tell people what to do. But to do it with warmth and kindness and compassion, while still occasionally, you know, serving up a, a nice helping of tough love, you know, that's tricky. And she, she was the master. Amy Dickinson writes the Ask Amy column for the Chicago Tribune and syndicated papers all around the country. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first Capitola Planning Commission of 2013. Uh, tonight's meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communication, Cable TV Channel 8, and is being recorded to be replayed at 12 noon on Saturday following the meeting on Community Television of Santa Cruz County, Charter Channel 71, Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website at www.ci.capitola.cal.us. Our technician tonight is Victor Herman, and as a reminder to the audience present, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. And to have your name recorded correctly in the minutes, if you wish, please sign in your name on the sheet at the podium if you're going to speak to us. You do not have to sign in, in however. Uh, with that, uh, may we have a roll call? Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Ruth? Here. Newly appointed Commissioner Welch? Here. And Chairperson Graves? Okay, here too. Uh, let's all stand for Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First thing, order of business tonight is 2A, and I'd like to personally welcome uh, T.J. Welch, uh, to our midst, and uh, I believe the clerk will be giving the oath to Mr. Welter, uh, or Ryan. our head planner will be giving the oath. Uh, Ryan, it's all yours. Congratulations. Congratulations. Would you like to say a couple words other than the ones you just said? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, the, the amazing uh, part about that oath is that you bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the United States and to the state of California, but in nowhere does it say the laws of the city of Capitola. That's correct. It's That's just amazing. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> That's probably why the council know. doesn't follow up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First, I, first item of business is the election of a chair uh, for the coming year. Is there a nomination? I nominate uh, uh, Commissioner Ruth. Is there no second necessary? Any other nominations? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Okay. Mr. Ruth, you take over and find us a vice chair, and I'll trade you. Okay. Seats. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners. I'll try and expedite the meetings as fast as possible in the next uh, coming year. We don't want them to think you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so then our first order of business is to nominate and select a vice chair. I would like to nominate Gail Ortiz. Do we need a second for that? No. No? Any other nominations? Okay. All in favor of Gail Ortiz being the vice chair for the coming year? Aye. 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 Opposed? You have to abstain. No, you can vote for yourself. I, I say aye. <laughs> okay, that brings us to item C, committee appointments. And... Uh, 
I'm trying to. Th I, we're all serving now, with the exception of TJ, on various committees. Correct. So, I'd like to get off one. <laughs> <laughs> so, would it be, does anybody have any desire to change? I am not serving on one. You're not? I don't know how I got that one, but I have a question about the traffic and parking. Is it, is it my understanding that that one is not long for this world? Is that being disbanded? Uh, no, they actually discussed the uh, boards and commissions at the last council meeting, and with the exception of the Commission on the Environment, which they did not make a decision on, they continued all of the others. So traffic and parking is going to be around. It's my understanding they've gone to, and perhaps Chair Ruth knows more than I know, but I think it's a monthly meeting schedule no, it's right now. Is it's it more like once month? every three months. Okay. But I'm hoping that we'll take a role in some oversight for the uh, new tax money that's coming in for streets. So we'll Good. see. Good. Can you remind us who uh, is on each of the commissions? Y you know, it doesn't say on here, but Ed was the GPAC. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm traffic. I'm committee on the environment. Ron. I'm Martin Cultural. And Linda. I would say I think our junior uh, commissioner should be. Uh, Commission on the Environment. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that seems to always go to the to the new. Uh, it's a low low yeah, person on the totem pole. T T J T J. Let me tell you. It's been a long time since I've been a rookie, but <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting commission. Uh, they had to twist my arm last time to do it. I did enjoy it. Um, I think I enjoyed it because you always see Dennis there uh, as one of the people on the commission, and that makes it lively. Uh, certainly. Um, what I d don't like about it is that there's so many professional environmentalists on it that they're off in the world doing something else environmentally, so we have a hard time getting quorums and having a regular schedule. So you How don't. How often do they meet? It's probably every, an easy every, one. Every, they're supposed to meet every other month. Okay. Um, um, Commissioner Graves is correct. We're having a little bit of difficulty right now because there are a number of vacancies in that group, so trying to come up with enough people to have a, a meeting has been a problem. Yeah, well, count me in. Okay. okay. Sounds like you have an interest in it. That's right. That's <laughs> so we will appoint TJ to the uh, Commission on the Environment. Gail, would you like to take Ed's place on the GPAC? I would be happy to do that if, if no one else wants it. Um, okay. 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 Do we need to confirm these with a vote? Uh, you can all agree among yourselves. Okay. Is there any disagreement to these appointments? Okay. Then those appointments shall be so made. And Council Member Ruth is going <coughs> to stay. I'll on remain on the traffic and parking. Okay. And um, Commissioner Smith is going to stay on art arts and, arts cultural. and cultural. Okay. That brings us to item three: oral communications. If there's anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on an item that's not on the agenda, now is the time to do that. If you want to speak to an item on the agenda, you have to wait till that item comes up for discussion. But now is the time for items not on the agenda. Anybody want to say anything about anything? See, no one? We'll move on with the agenda. Any additions or deletions? Uh, no. no. Nope. So that brings us to our first. Uh, Oh, to public comments. What, what happened to the items on the agenda here? We did public comments. Oh, there we are. Okay. Oh, You're actually a <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got it. Okay. So any commission comments? I have one. one? Uh, uh, came to my attention that uh, over the holidays that um, a colleague of mine here on the city felt that I was an embarrassment to the city and I want to publicly apologize if I have ever embarrassed the city. I've been involved with it for 38 years, and I can remember after 20-some-odd uh, years, uh, they did a roast for me at uh, Shadowbrook, and the chief of police roasted me dearly uh, for what are called malapropisms, and I have a habit of doing that, and if that's an embarrassment, I'm guilty of it, and so I'm publicly apologizing. Thanks, Ron. Any staff comments? Um, <coughs> uh, only that I have a couple items on the director's report at the end uh, to talk about that may take 10 or 15 minutes, just so you're not planning to run out too quickly. Okay. 
Okay, then our first item of real business here is the December 6th Planning Commission meeting minutes. Are there any additions or corrections? Move the minutes as prepared. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think I, I abstain. Abstain. Yeah. Okay. That brings us to item five, the consent calendar. These are uh, items that aren't normally raised for discussion unless a, a member of the Planning Commission wants to discuss them or a member of the audience wishes to further discuss the item. There's one item tonight, and that's uh, 723 El Salto Drive. It's a prior application that was approved by uh, this body to uh, convert four apartment units into condominiums. The applicant is Doug Dodds. Uh, anyone want to discuss this? Pull it. Nope. Anyone in the audience want to talk about it? Nope. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the request to extend the uh, approvals for permits? Also move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Can I vote no? What? Can I vote no? Yeah. Okay. You didn't ask for no. So. <laughs> I thought you voted. I thought you voted yes. <laughs> um, just to let you know, my no is that uh, uh, when applications are made before the city, there's a specified period of time in which they should be uh, acted upon, and I think <coughs> the city has embarked on a very dangerous path because over the years, conditions in any zone change, and uh, many of these applications are getting renewed every two years now, and I just thought that, you know, this one especially is the four-unit complex up in El Salto Resort. The parking will not be on site. There's a whole bunch of things that make these, make these things change. And so I just think continuing them on a regular basis just on a consent is a bad idea. Sorry about that. Okay. And yeah, that brings us to item six, public hearings. Um, these are intended to provide an opportunity for the public to discuss these items. Um, there will be a staff presentation, then public discussion, uh, planning commission comments will close the public portion of the hearing and the planning commission will discuss and make a decision. So our first item then is 1941st Avenue, application 12155, an amendment to an existing restaurant conditional use permit, the Capitola Diner, to incorporate a bar use and allow live entertainment in the CC zoning district. Ryan? Yes, good evening. Um, so the applicant is requesting an amendment to the existing restaurant um, use permit. Uh, I should mention that there is a bar there now. Um, the wording here might be a little bit off in terms of incorporating a bar. There has been a bar there for many years. What they're looking to do is extend the bar hours um, to a later later time on, on Friday and Saturday nights. And, and then the allowing live entertainment, that is an, a new thing to be proposed as part of the conditional use permit. So um, to start off, this is the site here um, on 41st Avenue. I think for many years it had been a Lions restaurant. Um, it's changed ownership several times over the past few years, and it's now the Capitola Diner. Um, and it's continued to be a restaurant with a small bar area, and it's had standard hours generally from 8 a.m. to, uh, to 10 p.m. So here's a look at the existing bar that's, that's in the restaurant right now. Uh, it, it, like I said, it's, there's been a bar there for many years. This, it's been updated recently in the last year. Uh, the size of it hasn't really changed, um, uh, but it has been improved. It's approximately 5 feet by 15 feet in size, and it's really a small percentage of the overall restaurant. The, really, the, most, the majority of the building is restaurant made up of, you know, um, of uh, fixed bench seats and tables. So there, really are, there are no changes proposed to the interior or exterior of the building as, as part of this application. So um, as part of the amendment to the existing <coughs> restaurant use permit, um, the applicant, as I mentioned, is requesting to extend the business hours uh, to 12.30 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, the restaurant would continue to serve food, but the bar would also be open. Um, they're also requesting permission to have live entertainment. Um, they basically were suggesting a, a DJ um, that they could basically provide music for customers and if someone were going to come and celebrate a, a birthday party or, or something like that. There's no dance floor being proposed uh, at this time. Um, I should mention, as I did in my staff report, uh, there have been some incidences over the last couple of years that the police department has responded to um, where live entertainment was being provided without a valid entertainment permit. Um, 
they generally involved uh, a DJ playing music, large crowds, and other live entertainment. Um, and so, a, as you saw in the staff report, there's a memo that was provided by uh, uh, the police chief, Rudy Escalante, summarizes some of these events and has stated that, that, <coughs> that he cannot support the proposed amendment to the conditional use permit. The, uh, so in terms of recommendation, we certainly share the same concerns uh, expressed by the police department, um, but you know, with appropriate conditions of approval incorporated into the use permit, um, there's potential that we could support some of the aspects of the requested amendment. Um, we haven't received any complaints um, from any na neighboring residents, um, but obviously if we're going to amend the use permit, we want to make sure that we're not going to create any situations where um, it's going to create a nuisance. So keeping the neighbors and residents in mind, um, staff could support the restaurant and bar to remain open. Um, we think maybe midnight might be more appropriate than 1230. Um, and in terms of entertainment, I think there'd be, we added a condition that would limit the entertainment to a DJ only, so no live bands or any other type of live entertainment. Um, also, it should be noted that an annual entertainment permit from the police department will, will be required to be obtained um, on an annual basis. And this is just, they basically are going to look at um, more of the details in terms of uh, enforcing issues such as security and noise and, and those type of things. So if the Planning Commission can support the requested um, uh, conditional use permit, it's recommended that it be approved subject to the conditions and findings that we've provided. Any questions for staff? And I would mention that, um, that uh, Rudy Escalante, our police chief, is here and available for any questions. Okay. Questions. Does their current um, permit allow for a bar? It, it has been a restaurant with a small bar for many years. So basically, it's been grandfathered in, and that's been the use <coughs> for years. So um, that that is the current use. They're, what they're asking for an amendment to is to basically extend their hours to a later later time on Friday and Saturday nights, and also to provide live entertainment. Okay. <clears throat> Can you uh, let us know why you feel 12 is, is more appealing to you than 12.30? Um, well, it's something that, that we discussed and... Do you, there, do you there, yeah, there's residential neighborhood <coughs> behind this and um, certainly if a, a business is open, um, the, the parking lot abuts up to the residential neighborhood, so you will have people leaving. They're typically noisy. You have guard doors opening and closing. And so we were trying to come up with what we felt would be a <coughs> compromise that could work in the location where this restaurant is and um, still accommodate, um, you know, the rest the owners need to try and have a successful business and uh, the hours to midnight are on Friday and Saturday night only. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are the tables, you were mentioning that the majority of the, the, the building is given over to the restaurant function. Are you saying that there's a difference between the tables being specifically for food and not for alcohol or can people have alcohol at any of those tables? That's my understanding. I mean, it's it's basically, it has, I don't know if you've been in there in recent past, but it's, the majority of it has not changed in, that I'm aware of in many years. So it basically is the, the table seating, the way it's set up is not changed. And right now, I'm, my understanding, and maybe the applicant might be able to speak to it, the owner of the uh, business, but um, my understanding is that they will serve alcohol to people who are sitting and eating, right. but it's also it's available, <coughs> what they were looking at is having people come in, if they didn't want to eat, they could come to the bar and just have a drink. Okay, I'll ask the applicant a little bit. And I should also mention that right now their, um, their ABC license limits them to 10 o'clock a.m., so they, if this were to be approved, then they would need to also have that um, ABC license amended to allow this. Any other questions? I have one. Hope my voice holds out. Mm -hmm. uh, if the Planning Commission approved this application and the Police Department has the authority to issue the entertainment permits, but they are opposed to it, do they have to issue the entertainment permit? 
Uh, the police department has the authority to not issue an entertainment permit. The regulations for it, there's some guidelines that they are supposed to follow. And if they find that someone is not following those guidelines, they're not obligated to uh, issue an entertainment permit. They but can say no. Prior to that, if we just do a pr an approval here, can the police department say, we don't agree, we're not going to issue the entertainment permit? Uh, well, the chief is here, and he's probably um, uh, more familiar with the rules in the entertainment permit than I am, but uh, it's my understanding that he has the authority to issue or not issue okay. an entertainment permit, and he's um, happy for him to yeah. correct me if it's I'm It's never wrong. happened before, but right. I'm just wondering. Okay, no further questions? Okay, was well, the applicant in the audience? Do you wish to make a presentation, it's, uh, Mr. Salazar? We, we need you, you to come, come to the talk. microphone to talk. Yeah, we're just wondering if you have anything you'd like to add to the staff presentation to help convince us. Tienes algo que les quiero decir a ellos para que te puedan los puedas convencer para que te den el permiso? O sea, lo que yo quiero decir es para que mi negocio crezca un poquito más y tenga un poquito más de clientes, ajá, clientes y pueda ofrecer un poquito más de trabajo para mis empleados. So, um, the purpose of him wanting to request extension on Friday and Saturday is to, you know, for the business to extend and for employers to have more hours to work. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? I do. Yeah. Good evening. Um, my one question is, does, uh, do, can someone sit at the t all the tables and just have alcohol? <coughs> do they have to have uh, food too when they sit down at all of the tables or can they only have alcohol? <coughs> No, pueden ordenar comida las dos cosas, es lo que es el propósito, que sea, que sea abierto el restaurante, pueden haber gente que guste tomar. No, no pero de lo que ella está preguntando es que si en las mesas, solamente también si no, no quieren comer, no más quieren tomar, se, tienen, se pueden sentar en la mesa o se tienen que sentar en la barra. Uh, yo pienso que también en la mesa, especialmente en el área del bar, que está pegado. <coughs> um, there's tables that are nearby where the bar is because mm -hmm. it's kind of in three sections. Mm -hmm. So the bar is on the right side. Okay. And then there's tables right there. And the, sometimes people sit around there when all the, you know, the bar is full. So they'll just sit there and just have some drinks uh -huh. with no food. Right. But on the other side, we try to extend where it's, you know, where there's food and if they want to drink. We could drink also. So my question is, <clears throat> on that other side in the evenings, could someone sit over there in those t on those seats in the, in the on those tables without ordering food? See. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. For okay. My Any other questions for the applicant? I only have one. Um, some of the incidents that were in the letters that we got happened well after the current operating hours of 10 o'clock. Is there a reason for that? I mean, is it common that they stay open later than normal? Um, what incidents were you referring to? December 31st is one of them. Yeah, there were some incidents in, in um, the, the report that we got from the police chief in, I'll see, I'll quote them. Um, July 10th of 2011 at one o'clock in the morning and again in March of 2012 at 1 o'clock in the morning, and December 21st at 11.30 p.m. Esos días de la 1 de la mañana ya el restaurante estaba cerrado. Cerramos a las 12 y media, era bien sábado parece. Del día 21 de diciembre fue la comida que se hizo para los trabajadores. So the other two events that were in December 11th and March, you said, um, those were after the business was already closed. 
And then the one that um, happened on December 21st was for, it was the restaurant was closed, but it was just a party for all the employees who were in the business. Okay. 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 Any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak to this item? See no one, then we'll close the public portion, bring it back to the Planning Commission for discussion. Who would like to uh, lead off? <laughs> Gail? <laughs> You're moving your lips. <laughs> I have been. I, I have some opinions about this. Um, I would not feel comfortable going against what our Chief of Police has recommended, and I would recommend the same thing that he's recommended. <clears throat> I view this as a, a, after a certain time of the evening being a bar predominantly a bar and I think we need to look at this application considering that and um, I think with their past history I'm, I'm reticent about uh, <coughs> granting longer hours and uh, more impact on our police department. Okay. TJ any comments? Well I, I'm empathetic to uh, the police chief's um, request here However, in, even in his last letter, uh, um, he stated he gave them the application to how to go through the process so they could meet the requirements of the city. So since, in my mind, it looks like it, they can meet the requirements if they do meet the requirements. And also we have um, pretty good control o over being able to pull that permit if they violate any of our requests, which I'm sure uh, Chief Escalani would be on top of. And I, I, I do understand it puts a burden on our police department and the enforcement side, unfortunately, falls in, in his lap. Any comments? I'll make yeah. a comment if you go ahead. Yeah, please, please. You know, the the uses out on the 45th <coughs> Avenue area are our highest commercial use. Uh, the idea of offending neighbors, uh, I heard a good reason tonight with regards to uh, the back parking lot behind this establishment uh, with the late hours and the lights and people that have drank uh, tend to be loud. The exit door to this establishment, however, is on the north side of the building in the driveway area, and then you go back to that parking. That doesn't stop individuals from in being intoxicated <coughs> talking very loudly. Um, but what I wanted to mention is that we have other establishments out in that area that do serve alcohol. I can think of uh, Chili's, a very large concern, uh, and a chain. Um, uh, I think that Personally, this individual owner should be given a chance to operate under the rules. I think it's very unfortunate that he didn't come in and ask for permits under his present uh, 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 use permit. Uh, and that may have been, you know, a lack of understanding of the permit or, or something like that. I just uh, feel that with the guidelines that are set down by the staff, and limiting the hours to 12 midnight in that high commercial area. I, I don't think this is going to be a burden on the police department. I don't think it's going to be a burden on the citizens' capital. And I think it's going to give uh, one of those restaurants out there an opportunity to maybe stay open. I can think of Capitola Cafe going by the wayside, uh, Lions going by the wayside, which this is now the old Lions. Uh, uh, we had Marie Callender's, we had uh, uh, Red Lobster. Nobody's really made it because there is no nightlife out there to draw anybody to that area once the mall closes. And uh, times are tough, and economics are w what they are. Uh, I think we need to look at a little bit of leniency here. You know, I unfortunately served when we had many, many problems in the village with <laughs> alcohol and everything else, so I can understand how it could get out of hand. But that's a very confined area that is a visitor serving and a residential mix, probably not the best place to have bars and restaurants, yet we have a preponderance of them down there, and we've only got two or three up on the avenue, and uh, I don't see this being an imposition to the city. Okay. So now I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. <coughs> I really do share um, Dale's position on not going against you know what our chief of police says at the same time I share a lot of what Ron just said about the area and the use 
for that area. Um, part of my discomfort is that the rules that we have had in place haven't been followed. And in order to give them an opportunity to meet that, um, I would like to propose that maybe we do a one-year trial with the <coughs> opportunity for them to have the entertainment piece of it, but keep the hours to 10 o'clock and not extend the hours to 12 for a one-year trial period. And if they can follow the rules and we don't have complaints and the police department isn't overburdened um, with the, the increase in activity, then perhaps we could look at that point at extending the hours until midnight because we don't want to start generating problems, um, you know, after hours. And unlike Chili's, which is across the street and not abutted against residential, this property is, you know, with a, a concrete wall at the back right against residential homes. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about the repeated violations. Uh, it's three in one year, and I would think after the first violation, you'd get the message that this is not allowed. And the fact that there was one less than, or about a month ago, concerns me even more. And then the response to Linda's question in regards to the violation was, it was almost as if, well, they were okay to do those things because it was after hours. And uh, I have some difficulty with that. Um, I could support the application if I saw a lengthy track record of lawful operation. And so I would want to see that first before I could support the application. So I'm thinking at least through the end of summer, give them two-thirds of the year to operate legally without any violations. If they were willing to come back and apply again, then, then I could support it. But right now, uh, with the history of violations, I can't support it. Any other comments? If you were if you were to support it later on, would it be with a DJ or live entertainment? DJ. With DJ. Are you speaking of DJ as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The way I see it's being proposed is DJ only, and when I when I went and looked through the uh, R code, it looks to me as though we have pretty good control over. Is it five days notice we can withdraw a uh, um, entertainment permit? It's a short time. We can mm -hmm. we can see. So. I think it is. I, you know, I, for me, what I looked at was Chief Escalani sent them a letter saying, here's the application, the rules to, need to follow by. It seems to me like they're trying to comply. It's a business. I, I'm pro-business trying to help Capitola. But um, I, obviously I'm very empathetic to uh, the police chief's situation here. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Rudy Escalante, Chief of Police. Uh, you are correct. We could do that. One of the challenges as uh, well is they have to modify their alcohol beverage control permit as well. And the conditions in their ABC permit, which they have applied to modify, specifically states right now that, that you cannot have any live entertainment on the premise and that the consumption and sale of alcoholic beverages stops at 10 o'clock. Uh, so you know we have opposed that modification to ABC as well. So they could uh, deny their modification on their ABC permit and that would put me in a position where I still wouldn't be able to issue it because I would be going against their state license. Right. So I, I just want to put that information out to you as well. Uh, they have a Type 47 license, and uh, for those who are not aware, I can read you the conditions on that, which <coughs> is it's on sale general eating place, uh, authorize the sale of beer and wine and distilled spirits for consumption on the license premise. It authorizes the sale of beer and wine for consumption off the license premise and must operate and maintain the licensed premise as a bona fide eating place, and it must maintain a suitable kitchen facilities and must make actual and substantial sales of meals for consumption on the premise, and minors are allowed on the premise at that type of license. I have a question for staff. Thank you, Rudy. You're welcome. Um, if this is an appropriate time for me to ask it. Go ahead. Is there a condition that could be put onto the permit that requires that the premises be vacated at the close of business operating hours? Well, I, um, I think that you would have to give them some opportunity to sort of 
close down their business. If the restaurant closed at 10 o'clock, uh, you would then say that the premises needed to be vacated by 11. Um, but in reality, most restaurants uh, keep a minimal staff all night long to do cleanup and the rest of it. I can think of Paradise, um, uh, Zelda's has a person on all night. They're simply cleaning up and getting ready for the next day. So it also cuts down on vandalism and a whole other thing. So I think it would be pretty hard to enforce. I do too. I think Chairperson Ruth's suggestion is, is a reasonable suggestion to ask them to have a track record of, of, of conforming to our uh, ordinances and our laws and to come back and, and apply again when they've done so. And I would like to move that suggestion. Uh, could, could I ask one thing? Um, uh, would it be <coughs> possible for us to decide to continue their application, say, until um, the 1st of September uh, 2013? And that way, if there are no issues, they would be able to come back and come before you without having to repay fees and Absolutely. go through. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the motion then is to uh, continue the application to September 1st, 2013. Is there uh, a second? I'll second it. We have a second. Any discussion on the motion? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank so, you. Mr. Salazar, you have to wait until 2013. You can come back and come before us. If there are no violations during that period, you'll get your permit. It brings us to item B at 3555 Clare Street, Suite G. This is an amendment to an existing restaurant conditional use to allow an outdoor barbecue in the CC zone. Ryan? Yes, um, the applicant is requesting, uh, uh, this is again is an amendment to an existing use permit for Crown Cafe Deli and, and catering uh, in the Brown Ranch Marketplace. Um, this kind of all started, well here's, let's take a look at, uh, this is the Brown Ranch Marketplace. This is the specific location of uh, the deli I believe is here. And this is the area that we are going to be looking at. Um, in November of, uh, this last November 2012, the city received a complaint regarding a, a barbecue that was being located in the parking lot <coughs> of Brown Ranch Marketplace. The main concern really from the complaint was the barbecue and someone being able to trip on it or you know walking through the parking lot um, and it being a tripping hazard so we contacted uh, property management and uh, soon after they came in with a, an application to amend their use permit uh, to allow for an outdoor outdoor barbecue so this is the the location of the barbecue um, it's been op uh, the, the crown cafe and deli has been operating since about 2011 uh, when it took over the space so it, it formerly been a Quiznos. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the Crown Cafe, they, they basically serve hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, desserts, and do catering services, and generally open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. Um, previously, all food preparation had been contained within the building, and then they, they had the barbecue out there and, and started uh, to uh, have the barbecue out in, in the parking lot. Um, so the applicant is requesting this amendment um, basically for the barbecue for the purpose solely of, of um, barbecuing out there, not for any food service actually at the barbecue. All the food to be taken in and served um, within the restaurant. So this is what it looks like today. Um, as you can see, it's just a, a small portable barbecue. Uh, it's located on about a, a 12 by 9 concrete pad within the existing parking lot area. Um, <coughs> it's probably in recent weeks, probably in the last month, um, the wood fence was added and constructed around the barbecue to better designate the area, um, keep people out of it. And um, in my observation going out there um, over the last month or so, really there's smoke, but it has, doesn't appear to me to be a nuisance at all in terms of the fact that it's out in the parking lot and it not near any of the, uh, the businesses. So uh, staff is recommending approval and uh, subject to the conditions and findings we provided and I'm available for any questions. Okay. Any questions for staff? Do we have uh, hours of operation for the barbecue? Is it 
start earlier than the opening of the restaurant to get it going? Um, the applicant might be able to answer that question better than I can, but um, right now I believe their hours that they've listed is from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., so I think the barbecue would probably be used between those hours. Okay. The applicant? Good evening, Commissioners. Ron Clemens, Jr. Um, operation, we start the barbecue about 9 a.m. Okay. And does it run all, <coughs> all day, or do you... Generally, we start about 9 and cook till 1, and then we do a little afternoon, depending on the business. So it might go up around 2.30, 3 o'clock, and it's usually shut down around 4.30. We wish it was open till 7, where it's not that busy right now. Will you be doing, like, barbecue takeout? Oh, we do that right now. Mainly it's just barbecue for the sandwiches inside, and we do tri-tip plates and chicken plates. That's what it's mainly. We don't serve out there. We just cook it and bring it inside the uh, deli. The question I have, and the only concern I have, is there's a similar operation at the corner of Soquel and Trout Gulch Road, kind of set back behind the antique store there. Okay. And along, I know it's a little colder over there than it is where you guys are, but early in the morning when they start the barbecue along about 9, 9.30, 10, <coughs> the cold air just kind of lets the smoke just lay in there. Right. Have you experienced similar issues up there? Or we're, we're trying not to put very much smoke off at all. We're very conscious of that, especially with the neighbors. Um, we want to make sure that wind, something that we're really conscious more so of wind shifting towards our neighbors, our fellow business people. And so we try to contain that smoke, and I have not observed that. Okay. When Any you, other questions? Linda? When you start the, the grill, um, do you use a, a fluid, a lighter fluid to get it started? We do. We cook on mesquite or oak wood, and then we do start a lighter fluid. Okay. And... You start it and, and then it, it burns. I, I just want to make sure I understand. Do you have to go out and restart it frequently or does it pretty much stay going all day long? It stays going. We'll have to put charcoal on, on the afternoon, add a little bit more charcoal if needed. But usually there's enough coals there going that we don't have to put more lighter fluid on there. And do you have someone on your staff that's assigned to keep an eye on it to make sure that if the wind does come up that you don't have embers or anything? We do. Like we have one person generally on staff that just does the barbecuing. Okay. Well, are you associated with Ben Loman Market? We are. Okay. Yes. thought I'd recognize the name. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I did take the opportunity to drive by there two days ago, and it was it, they were just getting it going, and uh, literally no smoke. You could see the heat waves, but I couldn't smell anything from the mesquite, so it looks like a clean operation, fenced off. It was nice. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? It is a public hearing. Now's the time. See, no one will close the public portion and bring it back to the Planning Commission. Any I'm comments? Gonna, I'm going to jump right in. Because, okay, um, Linda? Because of about the same time that this was going in, we were having another issue with another outdoor barbecue grill, and in that event it was horribly, horribly um, smoky and, and very um, impactful, had a big ne negative impact. So although I, I can see ways that supporting this application is, is a possibility, I think that there need to be some pretty strong conditions um, <coughs> put on it so that we don't wind up in a position where we have to approve um, other outdoor barbecues that are going to have a negative impact. And uh, some of those items were smoke is a nuisance. I, am, I went out and looked at it today, and, and I agree that it may be the openness of the pit that keeps it from having a smoke build up, and then when you lift the lid, as in the other condition, that smoke just billows. Um, it's also far enough out away from the businesses that people are not going to have to walk by it except for the people that, you know, park right there. I parked right there and did get out and, and walk towards Trader Joe's, and you can smell it, but it's not, it didn't make me cough. Um, so I would like to see a condition added that somehow um, identifies that distance as being acceptable. I don't know if you can send somebody out to measure from where the location in, is to the sidewalk, but somehow have a condition that stipulates the approval is ba based on that distance. Um, is that distance, is that possible? distance is from adjacent businesses, you mean? To yeah. From adjacent from where? businesses, the barbecue from the adjacent businesses yes. is what you're referring to. Okay. And, and I'm su saying sidewalk, suggesting that the measurement should be 
maybe not to the front of the, the front door, but to the where people are walking. Right. So you could make that condition and we could fill in the number after we go out and measure it. Uh, what I hear you saying is this one is satisfactory where it is. You don't want it any closer to exactly. the businesses. Yeah. You, know, you know what concerns me, though, is s setting a distance <laughs> kind of in stone mm -hmm. is probably the wrong approach because if the wind were prevailing from the south or the southeast in this case, it would take it right at the place of business that's operating it. But if you had a barbecue, say, uh, like the one you complained about down in the village, that's much closer to the ocean, it got all the the downtown area and all the apartments above it and everything else. I believe that we're going to have so few applications that each one could be judged on its own merit based on the design of where the barbecue is to be located and how it's to be controlled and the rest of it, rather than, say, 125 or 250 feet or something like that. And I just want, while I'm talking, I'll just make a comment. I was very familiar with uh, the Zanato people uh, up in Scotts Valley, and they did this uh, both in Scotts Valley. They did it in San Jose down on, what was it, second or third? I don't remember the street exactly. And then they went out on the corner of uh, uh, Bascom and Nagley and uh, uh, did one there hugely successful for their deli operation, but uh, none of them made them stay in business. There was other problems within the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this is a draw. I think the thing that really impressed me about this is nothing's being sell sold from the barbecue area. And, uh, you know, I think they provided for cleanup and the rest of it. I think this is a probably a good location, as good as we could find up in the 41st Avenue area. Uh, but I'd like to judge everyone on its merit, not just say that this is a cookie <coughs> cutter and so many feet works. Yeah, and I'm what, I, what I heard Commissioner Smith saying was she would like a finding saying that the reason she could approve this one was because it is located um, so far away from the businesses. So not to set a precedent. Not to set a precedent and that, um, um, you know, it's appropriate in this okay, particular well, I, I location. Heard her, I heard her say condition, not finding, so that's why. I, I agree she did say my, condition, yeah, but I, I, I took it that she meant a yeah. finding. Okay. Yeah. My, my junior standing is... <laughs> no, 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 I'm not exactly picking on you. I mean. <laughs> I'm not picking on you. But I'd, I'd like for it to also include that there are no, you know, two-story structures um, adjacent to it, and that it's there aren't residences okay. adjacent to it because I think when we come up and I, I wish I I had the confidence that there wouldn't be many more of these, but I can see them happening other places along the 41st corridor, and I just want to make sure that when they do come in, that we're not mm. tied by precedent that we've set. So if if finding is the correct way, then. Um, but those are those are the three that I'd like to see included. We can incorporate those into the findings, yes. Any other comments? Yeah, I can say I worked up in the valley for five years, Ron, and I know your business up there is probably one of the most community-oriented business I've seen. And uh, so I think if there's a problem with this, uh, I'm really confident it would get taken care of right away. Yeah. So. I think it's a big asset to the center, and these are the kind of uses that bring character to... Um, otherwise more corporate kind of settings with large parking lots. I think it brings a lot of ambience and I've always really enjoyed seeing it out there and it makes me want to go now that I <laughs> meet you, it makes me want to go there. Okay. Ready for the question? I'd, I'd Ron? Somebody move? Not yet. I'll move the application with the additional finding that Linda wants and staff can uh, come up with that. Um, I just want to make a comment with this motion that the one that scares me that may be next, because I think you're right, uh, is Whole Foods. And Whole Foods has moved half of its operation out on the sidewalk, and it's violating its permit every day. So, you know, it's a, staff has enough trouble trying to do code enforcement, but, God, pretty soon you won't be getting able to get in the door of Whole Foods. Okay, we have Ron's motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck, Ron.
Okay, brings us to item seven, the director's report. Does anyone uh, uh, have Ryan. a comment? Ryan? Uh, I have a couple of items to talk about. Uh, Ryan's going to help me out by bringing up a little PowerPoint. Um, <coughs> I think that um, uh, you're all familiar with a project that was approved here in Capitola uh, at the corner of uh, Hill and um, Capitola Avenue. Uh, there was a retaining wall in and a subdivision uh, above it for uh, five residential units. And one of the conditions on the project, and we can keep going through, is that um, the, the fence behind these backyards was supposed to be open. And unfortunately, when it went through the process, we've ended up at keep going, the retaining wall and a um, area of dirt which was never required to be landscaped as part of this project. And um, so two of the residential units there are occupied and they've come in because they are concerned about privacy and noise. And while it's not our problem, uh, there was a solid fence up there when they sort of purchased the homes. And then when we went to final the project, the city made them take the solid fence out because that had not been a condition of the project. And so they've, they've ended up with the uh, chain fences. Uh, they've approached the city with um, the idea, and you can keep going, mm -hmm. that uh, they would uh, have a landscape plan prepared for that area. They would install the landscaping along the entire area because the contractor who's building the house in the middle is not being particularly cooperative. And uh, once they had the landscaping in place, that they would like the opportunity to put up a solid fence. And um, if we were going to go that route, it would be my suggestion that they only be allowed uh, to put up a five foot fence with perhaps a foot of trellis on top of it that would give them ultimately a six foot fence. Uh, but it would provide them with um, some privacy, some sound reduction, and solve the problem of sort of having this strip of no man's land between the concrete wall and where the property line is. And I know that, uh, you know, this, this is a difficult issue for everyone, uh, and you don't even have to decide it tonight. Um, but if you would go look at it, I think you would find that we need to come up with some sort of solution or we've created sort of an eyesore for ourselves. Can I ask a question? Sure. Are you recommending that the <clears throat> fence actually come forward and be adjacent to just right behind the wall? No, I'm recommending that there's, in some areas, it goes as wide as five feet down to three feet, that that dirt strip there be planted right. uh, with an appropriate landscaping plan, bushes, and perhaps some vine that would grow down the wall. Um, so that we would have the wall, we would have landscaping, and then we would have a fence. And do do all of them have to have the same one, or would each each I would owner come in with a different? <coughs> no, I would think we would want a consistent fence design. Uh, and then, if that is true, uh, who irrigates that? Uh, well, um, we could. Um, I think they would. No, I mean, no, of course no, no. they would. But who? Which of them would? And who? Do they all do each their own irrigation? down to their own piece of land? Well, I think own? we're going to have to decide if, if we're going to have it irrigated or not irrigated. Uh, and that's something that we might want to work with a landscape person. We could certainly get some sort of bond, which you know we would get to keep for the first year so the plants could become established. But the... Um, uh, you know, the, the water district has gotten pretty touchy about issuing um, 
any kind of water meter for irrigation purposes only. Well, it would just be part of, you know. Right. Or they could just do it from their, for it, right. for, from their yard there. Just a little background. I was on the commission when we approved this, and the reason that we didn't want a solid fence was because we felt that it was, it would be a, a large mass <coughs> of, of this court, create kind of a corridor right. on that side. Um, and sort of looking at it now, I, I don't Ugly. think it really would if it were a solid fence. I think did anybody see it when the fence was there? It looked better than it does it now. sure did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looked really good. I think it would be all right. The thing, the, 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 the thing that concerns me is that if we let them have a solid fence and then they build something, or they, they plant on the other side of it, I wonder what their ownership of that planting material would be and whether they can just forget it and it doesn't even feel like their own property and it's kind of outside on the si on the street and we're going to end up with a lot of stuff that just doesn't look good over the long run, doesn't get maintained, doesn't get, you know, because it's not in their yard. Right. Um, well, it seems that we could do this with some sort of agreement with them uh, and the agreement could include maintenance of the landscaping and as I said we certainly could come up with some sort of bond or cash deposit that we could keep for a period of time to uh, make certain that the landscaping was established and if you're willing to consider something like this what I would do is uh, work with the city attorney and see what kind and the public works director and see what kind of arrangement we could work out for maintaining the landscaping okay okay any other questions on that I say go for it yeah yeah okay it's one of the well-meaning conditions that fell flat on its face. Yeah. One of many. Uh, so the other item which I had in, um, I was going to ask you about this, is there was a discussion at the city council meeting last week uh, regarding some concepts for the zoning ordinance. And I didn't know if you were interested in having me go through some of the items that were discussed there, or if you all watched it on television and you're comfortable uh, with what you saw and you don't need any kind of explanation from staff. I'd like to get a little something. Okay. Okay. Um, we actually um, have a PowerPoint in the same file, this? right, that one. Okay. And we can go through this very quickly. And maybe if you give me, I'll, I'll, I'll do this one yeah. so we can go through it really fast. This is really, we won't go through the whole PowerPoint presentation. This is just so um, I don't miss anything. Um, we did talk about the goals of why we want a new zoning ordinance. I think you all know that uh, we're doing the general plan, the local coastal plan is incorporated in the general plan. The additional documents besides the general plan, local coastal plan document will be a new zoning ordinance and will be a climate action plan. Um, we have gotten far enough along in the process that we have adopted uh, through the GPAC committee uh, what is going to be proposed as a new land use plan and there are not really any what I would call significant changes. There are some minor tweaks that are going to, to go on. Uh, what we had talked about with the city council was perhaps modifying the architectural and site review process because um, uh, what we find is so many applications are minor remodels to existing residential and we were trying to come up with a way to speed up that process and we also find that we are not working well with a fire, water, zone 5 and other agencies because we're having applications approved here. They go to get a water meter. The water district says we will not issue you a water meter with the landscape plan that you got approved. And so we're, we're going back and forth. Uh, basically, the city council said that they were not interested in simplifying the process. They liked the applications going to the Arkham Site Committee. They liked the structure of that committee. And so um, that's pretty much going to stay the same 
uh, as it is right now. Uh, we talked about single family. Um, the, our current general plan <coughs> actually says that we're going to have 10 um, dwelling units per acre, but our zoning ordinance requires 5,000 square feet uh, for each lot, which actually only results in eight units per acre. And so we had suggested going to 4,300 square feet uh, per unit um, so that we would be consistent with the 10 units per acre that was in the general plan and uh, the direction was they, that they like it the way it is. Um, we talked about uh, one of the big changes that will come about in single family residential is there is a state law that requires you to allow transitional housing as a permitted use in all of your R1 zoning districts and the city has never made that change but it will be included in the new draft zoning ordinance. So what's and the definition of tr tr transitional housing? Uh, it's quite broad. It can be a sober living facility, it can be a group home, it can be um, uh, uh, convicts returning to society home. It's uh, basically you have to look at them as single family uh, okay. uses. Uh, we are going to come up with some different development standards for some individual neighborhoods and we've talked about this before. The lots on Riverview Terrace average 2,800 <coughs> square feet. The lots in Cliffwood Heights are 7,000 square feet. So having the same rules for each, you know, citywide uh, doesn't always work too well. Um, we talked, uh, again, this was staff uh, approving some projects which got turned down. We do want to uh, simplify how the floor area ratio is calculated. Uh, a lot of people want front porches to be um, features on homes and one way to encourage front porches is to not count them in the FAR. Uh, we also currently include basements and um, the suggestion uh, was made to take basements out. Well, we don't currently include porches. We, we took that out a long time ago when we, when we looked at our floor area ratio you, you, and changed you that. You only allow a very small porch. Right. This would allow a bit larger okay. porch on there. Right now uh, it's 150, right? Right now so. it's 150 square feet, I think. Yeah. Um, Currently, uh, the way we do uh, for non-conforming structures, if they're going to have an addition to them, you have this section that talks about if 20% to the value of the home is left in place, then you can do basically a new house. And we have an example up on uh, Riverview Avenue right now where there are two houses being built side by side and one of them was under the 20% rule and what we find as staff is they leave that 20%, they build the other part of the house, then they tear that 20% down and rebuild it so it ends up being a completely new house but the house on the left has a 15 foot long driveway and uh, we all know that 15 foot long driveways don't work whether you have a Prius or whether you have the Suburban back there and so we want to uh, come up with a new way of, of looking at that, that we don't keep ending up with new houses that still don't conform to what the zoning standards are, particularly for driveways and parking. Um, in the REM district, we had proposed uh, some increase in density, uh, which would reduce the lot size and all of those were turned down unanimously. They want to stay with the densities that we currently have. And um, the reason for doing this <coughs> to have a little bit of background is we do have some expectation in our next go around as far as housing elements are concerned. We're, go we're going to have to provide some, some more density somewhere in, in Capitola. 
probably the, the hot topic was the Central Village. Uh, we started out with the hotel. Um, the uh, GPAC has gone through a process with a public hearing and at their meetings and they have adopted some um, standards to be used if a hotel is going to be developed in the village and so we were suggesting uh, including those standards for that project uh, here's the the drawing that was was developed uh, for a hotel it actually has it um, uh, being uh, on the back part of the hotel uh, 55 feet which has it 12 feet below the top of the bluff area uh, one suggestion um, uh, was made uh, that um, uh, you do have to provide parking in the village. There may be a possibility of doing some sort of in lieu parking program, uh, which could be used if there was a hotel development or other development down in the village, because with the temporary parking lot going in, um, we're looks like it's going to end up being 227 spaces. Our shortfall is 176 currently with the Coastal Commission, so that would free up uh, approximately 50 spaces that um, an in-lieu parking program could work with. Um, we have problem as staff counting seats, particularly in takeout restaurants. Um, uh, there's got to be a, a, a better way of doing that. Most zoning ordinances have a square foot rule, so staff doesn't have to keep going down and counting seats because right now we base parking on seats and uh, that, that doesn't work too well. Would that be square footage for the sales area only, not, <coughs> not production area? Yes, most of the ordinances I've seen only talk about the actual area that you serve food in. Um, there was uh, some discussion about uh, changing the height limit in the overall village itself uh, and uh, I think this got a little distorted by the original newspaper article because the, the purpose was not to allow an intensification. The purpose was to uh, come up with something where you would have um, you know, a height of habitable space or usable space, you would come up with a term for it, but allow some additional roof treatments to go on because what we're finding is when buildings are rebuilt in the village now, uh, we tend to have, um, you know, sort of uh, flat roof type buildings. And we do have buildings in the village right now which are three stories. This is the superintendent's building and uh, it has a third story that's uh, more integrated into its roof line. Uh, this is a single family residence which does meet the 27 foot height limit and there are two others are a duplex being built down there right now which is doing exactly the same thing. So they are getting three stories in the 27 feet. It's just they, they become quite Boxy. Um, this is an example, you know, that we sort of overlook sometime of a three-story uh, building in the village, but the part that's on the street is two stories, and then the third-story part is is set back from the sidewalk itself to to give it a little interest. Uh, this is a new building that went down in the village, and if you measure to the very top of that. Uh, that building actually uh, measures out at 35 feet uh, using the way we do measurements. Um, uh, we we want to maintain the residential uses in the village and that's actually a requirement in our local coastal plan. Uh, it has a lot of language about, you know, <coughs> a village is not just a commercial area but a residential and commercial area. We wanted to change regulations that would make it easier to have some outdoor activities and special events in the village. Uh, there were some people who are in favor of that, some people who are not. Um, 
and you can stop me. I'm going through this quickly because I don't want to take up too much of your time. <coughs> um, we also wanted to have, you know, um, recognize that whatever we propose down there, we do have to take through the Coastal Commission because they have jurisdiction over the entire village area and most of the village uh, is actually in their appealable zone. So they get the last say on anything that happens down there. Um, neighborhood Commercial, which uh, runs up Capitola Avenue and Commercial Residential, which is on Capitola Road. Uh, we're looking at combining those into one zoning district. Uh, the council said they thought that was a good idea, but they were not in favor of any kind of increase in intensity or density in those areas as a result of them being combined. Uh, we only have uh, one small area. It's where the AAA building, that complex, and the complex across the street that's professional office. So we're going to eliminate that zoning district itself and incorporate those properties into what will be uh, the new sort of multi-use district that will be on Capitola Road and Capitola Avenue. Um, in the industrial park, there's no major changes. Uh, Non-conforming, as I said, it would go to measuring by square feet. In the <coughs> sign ordinance, what we're trying to do is come up with one that's consistent with state and federal law. We're not talking about making any major changes to size of signs that people are allowed to have. Um, people would like to see the halo lit signs and perhaps uh, not allow the internally lit signs. Uh, the halo light seems to be a bit of a softer approach. And we need to make some changings to our secondary dwelling unit ordinance. Uh, we're having cases where people are using that to actually get a house that's bigger than they would be allowed to have uh, and then they never rent out the second dwell, you know, the granny unit, second dwelling unit because it's, it's attached and that way they just they just end up with a bigger house and that's a loophole that people have actually easily figured out in a pretty... You know, uh, most of these problems come about by the state getting involved. Yeah, a lot of them do. Um, green building ordinance we're going to keep will be consistent. We want to be um, have requirements that are beyond what the state law has right now because we want to require uh, green building and tenant improvements and state law doesn't require that. Um, right now a lot of the city is in an archaeological uh, district and you're supposed to do this extensive report to do anything and we want to change that so if like you're adding a second story onto your house you're not digging in the dirt that you don't have to do uh, a report just make it more sort of a common sense kind of approach to it. Uh, in your transient rental ordinance, uh, people are supposed to come every year and get a new use permit if they're going to have a vacation rental and clearly you don't see those use permits coming before the Planning Commission every year and it's probably not necessary to have you or staff or the applicant go through that process on an annual basis, so we're, we're looking at changing uh, that. Um, mobile homes, uh, the council wanted to eliminate the section that allows two-story mobile homes in our mobile home parks. Um, and um, uh, as far as uh, there's been some concern raised um, we have these mobile home parks that have now all been subdivided into little lots. They're legal lots of record. You're all familiar with the legal concept that you are allowed to build on a legal lot of record. And um, we want to make certain we have some provisions that the mobile home parks now don't just become little subdivisions that don't provide um, you know, adequate services or streets. Uh, and the council actually wanted us to investigate whether or not the city could take over the inspection of mobile homes 
uh, the state now does that in our mobile home parks. And that was pretty much it. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Well, it looks like the city council stopped a few of your ideas, but I hope the uh, concept of working with the other organizations, agencies, Zone 5 and yeah. SoCal Water District moves on, and we become a nice, consistent process for people building. Yeah, we want, we want to try, you know, it's fine for people to have to go through a process, but you want it to be as simple and as efficient as you can make it. We had asked to get uh, the water, um, the rules on water use and irrigation and all that from both water districts. I noticed that in the minutes of one, uh, one of our previous meetings. Is that uh, so that We're we know when we come up against these questions during these meetings, we know what both of those agencies want of capital. We, we, we are required by another state law to adopt a landscaping uh, water conservation ordinance. And it'll actually be a part of your zoning ordinance. And so we've been working with the water district. They're modifying some of their regulations right now, and we're working on coming up with regulations that you are going to have that are going to be consistent with theirs. And what about but, Santa Cruz? Um, we are not working with Santa Cruz right now. Uh, I know we need to because there's a part of 41st Avenue that's along there. Um, uh, our goal was to work with SoCal first and sort of come up with a preliminary ordinance that we thought that would work and then we were going to go to Santa Cruz and talk to them. Okay. Because we, we seem to be coming up against these <clears throat> not knowing what they want of us and us asking for things right. and then coming back to the same old thing and making the applicant go through a lot of steps and you right. go through a lot of steps that we don't want to have happen. Mm -hmm. Any other communications from the commission? Just, um, I will Linda? not be here at the October meeting. Just giving you fair I warning. I won't be here at the October, October. meeting either. Cool. So. October, <laughs> October and I will be here like at the February 11 months away, right. 10 months yeah. away? February. So <laughs> they are recruiting for a new community development director. It's my understanding interviews are going to be on February 19th, mm -hmm. which I think is real good for the city, and they need to have a full-time person here. Who it's actually stays longer than about, well, I don't know, a few months. Right. I think that Ryan has worked for eight community, community <laughs> development <laughs> directors eight? in his tenure here, if you count the interim people. <laughs> the February one, you'll be gone. I'll be so, so both of, of you will be gone for the February? I'm be gone for February. No, so I'll, I'll be here. I'll be gone. But the Gail will, will be gone and TJ so will be we're gone. We're going to have three, so we're okay. going to be careful about what the schedule. Okay. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Just make sure you bring the straws, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, so TJ, this was a quick one.